Ed is prepping a new car for delivery. He's been checking the ignition system to find the cause of a bad miss. Now the engine's running okay, but he's still not satisfied. Let's move closer so we can find out what's going on. Hey, Al, that plug didn't fire because the electrode gap was closed. Regapping was all it needed, so I put the same plug back in. Okay, so let's move her out. Right away, Al. But the engine's running slower than the spec setting, so I'd better raise the idle speed a bit. Hold it, Fred. That engine is still fairly stiff. If you raise the idle speed, we could get the car back in a hurry with a high idle speed complaint. Huh? But won't the engine stall in traffic if the idle speed's lower than specified? Not as a rule. The factory sets the carburetors on these new jobs, so they'll give an acceptable idle during and after engine break-in. You see, today's engines are designed to idle faster as a result of the changes brought in by emission control. Even though a brand new engine runs slower because it's stiff, it still idles somewhere near the speed specified for past models. With the factory setting, Engines with less than 50 miles usually run about 75 revolutions lower than the speed specified after break-in. As the mileage climbs from 50 to 300, the engine gradually loosens up, so the speed is only about 50 revs lower. Then, the original adjustment holds the idle close to the basic spec speed as the engine breaks in. In most cases, you shouldn't have to readjust the idle speed on a new engine, even after it loosens up. Don't forget to tell Fred how raising idle speed when prepping a new car can also affect the ignition timing. Hi, Tech. Thanks for the reminder. You see, Fred, raising the idle speed on a stiff engine can open the throttle valve far enough to expose the spark advance port to manifold vacuum. As you know, any vacuum advance at idle will upset emission control. So, even where a new engine idles slower than specs, we have to remember that only a small increase in throttle valve opening can cause vacuum advance. In fact, only a slight shift from its proper bore alignment can reposition a throttle valve enough to upset the distributor vacuum unit's normal cut-in point. So don't overlook throttle valve alignment if the vacuum advance unit jumps the gun. Actually, the proper throttle position at idle can cause a slight vacuum at the distributor. If the vacuum stays below four inches, it'll not move the vacuum advance unit. However, when the vacuum goes higher, the distributor vacuum unit advances the ignition timing at idle, and this tends to further increase idle speed. This speed increase can make driving difficult, especially in heavy traffic or on slippery surfaces. In addition, the customer may complain about creeping caused by the engine idle speed up, or lurching when the automatic transmission is engaged. Besides, if you set a stiff engine to the specified idle speed, the speed increase that's normal as the engine loosens up can also start the centrifugal advance unit into operation at idle. When this happens, the engine may not slow down in a normal manner when you let up on the accelerator pedal. You see, the centrifugal unit in the distributors used with emission control engines starts its advance movement sooner than in previous engines. Also, it adds more advance at low speeds, so you can get quite a bit of unwanted timing advance if the idle setting is above the specified idle speed. In other words, if you accelerate an engine which idles up near the starting point of the centrifugal unit, the advance mechanism and idle speed may not come all the way back to their starting points when the accelerator pedal is released. Right, Tech. The effect of centrifugal advance at idle is similar to the throttle closing lag caused by incorrect adjustment of the dash pot. With centrifugal advance, the idle remains high, even though the throttle closes as far as the speed adjusting screw allows. Don't forget that sticky or improperly adjusted throttle linkage can also cause throttle lag. And make sure that carpeting or loose floor mats do not interfere with the accelerator pedal return. If linkage and pedal movement are okay, it's easy to check out throttle closing lag. Simply close off the distributor vacuum unit hose and hold the dash pot plunger clear of the throttle lever. Then if you still get throttle closing lag, check the idle speed screw setting. Whatever you do, don't try to cure throttle lag by raising the tension of the throttle return spring. All you'll manage to do is raise the accelerator pedal effort and maybe irritate the customer. 
Wow, do you mean all that can happen just from raising the new engine idle speed a few revolutions? Right. They weren't fooling a few tech sessions back when they warned us that all settings and adjustments are now more critical than ever before. And while we're on the subject, high idle speed can also cause engine after running when you shut off the ignition. After running happens most often when the engine's hot, especially after long high speed runs in hot weather. Here's what happens. First of all, the basic ignition timing of our current engines is more retarded at idle than in past models. This makes combustion more complete, so the exhaust will meet emission standards. However, retarded timing also causes some of the idle mixture to continue burning as it leaves the combustion chambers. The longer burning process retards the removal of combustion chamber heat through the exhaust stream. Because of this, the chamber temperature can get high enough to cause dieseling if the throttle is open too far when the ignition is cut off. Care to add anything, Tech? Yep. To prevent unwanted ignition advance at idle as the engine breaks in, the idle speed should be 75 revs low on engines with less than 50 miles or 50 revs low on engines with 50 to 300 miles. And where you have after running, you can use the same in-between speed settings. But after engine break-in, make sure the idle speed setting is exactly as specified. Also make certain that the manifold heat control valve operates okay. You look like you're ready with a question, Fred. Well, after break-in, some engines don't come up to fast idle speed right after a cold start, but they're okay after a minute or two. Why don't they run at fast idle at the start? If the fast idle cam works okay, but its effect is delayed, the initial engine slowness can be caused by low temperature. You see, the mixture does not burn efficiently right after a cold start, and the crankcase oil may be a bit thick. After the engine runs a short time, combustion improves, and the engine loosens up. So you get regular fast idle operation. Okay, that makes sense. Now, what about an engine that stalls just once after a cold start, and then runs okay after it's restarted? The cause of the stall is also related to low temperature, but in a different way. In this case, we're concerned with choke and vacuum kick settings. Here's what happens. When the engine is cranked to start, the bimetallic choke coil holds the choke valve closed. As soon as the engine starts to run, choke closing force is balanced against the opposing pull of the vacuum kick unit. The vacuum kick unit opens the choke valve a specific amount to produce the proper mixture needed for good engine performance after starting and during warm-up. In fact, your single cold stall can be caused by the choke valve opening too far. Usually you can correct this stalling condition by adjusting the vacuum kick exactly to the specified setting. However, in the opposite direction, the warm-up mixture is too rich if the choke valve does not open far enough. Actually, only a small variation from the specified vacuum kick setting will cut down fuel economy, especially in slow city traffic or short trip driving. All of which is another example of why settings and adjustments have to be on the nose. Al, once in a while some engines stall after hot starts. Uh, why not tell us about that? Oh, you mean those 68 engines which sometimes die out after a hot start with the air conditioner turned on. Well, basically it's an engine load condition which requires special attention when you set idle speed. Here's why. The added load of the compressor can slow the idle enough to cause a hot stall. To compensate for this, you can set idle speed with the air conditioner turned on, but don't set it higher than needed to clean up the stall. You see, this setting makes the engine idle faster than specs when the conditioner is shut off. If you use this setting, make sure the resulting speed increase does not cause after running. Okay, Al, shut her off right there. We'll be after running off this side of the record if someone doesn't turn her over. Where cold stalling is a problem, be sure the customer understands that proper starting procedure helps the engine start easier and also reduces stalling. New cars now have special tags which tell how the engine should be started. Good points, Tech. When the recommended cam starting procedure is used, there's no guessing. The driver simply presses the pedal down all the way to release the fast idle cam and then lifts his foot off the pedal so the fast idle cam can do its job. You see, 
The starting step of the cam is specially designed to hold the throttle open the proper amount for efficient starting. After the engine starts, the same throttle opening keeps the engine running fast enough to prevent repeated stalling. Besides this, the starting step of the fast idle cam also holds the throttle at the right position to suppress cold start backfiring. If the throttle is too far open while the engine's being cranked, slow burning parts of the mixture charge which remain in the combustion chambers can cause backfire. After the engine's warmed up enough to run smoothly, the accelerator pedal should be tapped lightly. This drops the fast idle speed and reduces lurching when the transmission is engaged. Cam starting is the best and quickest method and temperatures down to zero. But you'll get better starts on part throttle when the thermometer stays below zero because cranking slower and more power is needed to overcome engine stiffness. Part throttle. What happened to cam starting all of a sudden? Well, the conditions are more demanding, so the procedure is different. Here you press the pedal down once all the way as in cam starting, but then you let the pedal up part way and hold it there while the engine's being cranked. After the engine starts, you release the pedal and let the fast idle cam do its job. When restarting a warm engine, a part throttle position is also best. But here you don't press the pedal to the floor first. Just press the pedal partway down while cranking the engine and hold it there. If you pump the pedal, the engine may take longer to start. While we're talking about starting conditions, there's something that all technicians should remember. If the engine doesn't start right off, don't keep the starter cranking without giving it a chance to cool off between tries. Always remember that the starting motor is designed for intermittent duty. This means that you can burn it out if you keep it cranking without let up, trying to start a balky engine. To guard against damage, limit starter operation to short periods, never more than one minute. If you run the starter a full minute, wait two minutes before you try again. If the engine doesn't start after several tries, you'd better start checking instead of wearing out the starter. And another thing. Don't ever let me catch anyone using a 6 and 12 volt series connected battery rig as a starting booster. That 18 volt blast can really sizzle the innards out of a starting motor before you realize what's happening. Okay, Tech, it won't happen here. Now, before I forget, there's a backfire condition that can be caused by an incorrect ignition timing setting, especially on some 68s with the 383 engine and a two barrel carburetor. This one takes more than a simple adjustment because the carburetor choke gets in the act. Here, backfiring can jam the choke valve shut, so you'll have to service the choke as well as resetting the ignition timing. Incorrect ignition timing on new engines can be the result of using old timing specs instead of checking the 68 service manual or the decal in the engine compartment. Here again, you can see that exact settings are so important that the factory puts the information near the engines. Say, Al, I see that the uh, air-fuel mixture ratio on those decals is 14.0 or higher, but the specs hold it to 14.2. Well, they're both right. The decal figure is mainly for the guidance of emission inspectors. However, the service manual specs give you a limit, so you won't try to set the mixture too lean for good idle operation. Actually, most engines do their best at 14.2, but a mixture anywhere between 14 and 14.4 puts emission within limits. Okay, Al, I'm sold on getting carburetor and ignition settings on the nose. I uh, sort of listened past that part when we had our session on the cleaner air system. Do you have time to give me a quick review? I'll be glad to, Fred. Actually, our present periodic service procedure is about the same as in the past. We just have to be more careful. To begin, make sure that the battery is properly charged so all the electrical equipment can operate properly. And don't just brush off the cable connectors. Pull them off so you can clean the battery posts as well as the cable clamps. Be sure to tighten the clamps securely and then check the other wire and cable connections while you're at it. To maintain good engine performance, you should clean, inspect, and adjust the spark plugs at least once a year or every 12,000 miles. Don't forget that too much torque can distort the plug shell and may change the electrode gap. For the average car, it's good practice to install new spark plugs every two years, or 24,000 miles. 
Be sure the replacements are of the correct type and heat range, or you may upset the engine performance and emission control. Also check the distributor every 12,000 miles, or at least once a year. Replace pitted or burned contact points. If the pitting or burning is bad, check the condenser capacity or the alternator charging voltage as needed. When you set the contact gap, it's a good idea to double check your work with a dwell meter. You'll need a tachometer when you check engine timing anyway, so with most testers, it only takes a flick of the switch to check the dwell. Incidentally, you'll find that it's good practice to make sure the point dwell is correct before checking the ignition timing for any reason. If the dwell needs resetting, it'll change the timing, so there's no sense in doing the job twice. Don't forget what Al said earlier about the effect that throttle setting has on the distributor ignition advance. Always block off the vacuum hose to the distributor and set idle speed before checking the ignition timing. If the engine misses or runs rough, it's a good idea to check the distributor cap, rotor, and high tension cables. Inspect the cap and rotor for cracks or spark tracks. Also check the cables for continuity and insulation leakage. If everything in the electrical department is okay, go on to the carburetor. The first step here is to clean or replace the air cleaner element as needed. At the same time, check the crankcase vent valve and, if necessary, replace it. If the filter or valve is dirty or restricted, you'll have poor engine performance and increased exhaust emission. Next, we make sure all carburetor linkages and the choke shaft are clean and operate freely. If a dash pot is used, it should be backed off temporarily so it won't interfere with throttle closing when we set idle speed. Before you start up the engine to make any settings, always check the manifold heat control valve to make sure it operates properly. If the valve is stuck open, the choke stays on too long and that'll ruin both the fuel economy and emission control. Where the heat control valve is stuck closed, the exhaust continues its manifold heating job after the need is passed. So the engine may start hard when it's hot because the carburetor is overheated. Fred, you're checked out on the combustion analyzer, so I won't go all through that. Now, where a vacuum control valve is used, be sure to close off the hose between the intake manifold and the control valve. This prevents the valve from causing timing advance, which will throw combustion readings off. Be sure to turn the mixture adjustment from rich to lean for the final setting. Most combustion analyzers are designed to indicate more accurately when you follow this procedure. And don't forget the final mixture adjustment must be checked with the air cleaner in place. After the idle mixture is adjusted, carburetor vacuum should read between zero and four inches of mercury with the distributor and manifold vacuum hoses closed off. A higher reading means that ignition timing, idle speed, or idle mixture are off the mark. Also on a car which has a vacuum control valve, you've got one more test to make. Tee a vacuum gauge into the distributor hose, but leave the carburetor and manifold hoses properly connected. Speed up the engine and then let it drop back to idle. If the valve is properly adjusted, the gauge reading should rise to about 15 and then hold for at least one second before dropping. On the way down, the vacuum gauge reading should drop below six within three seconds. If it drops faster or slower than this, the vacuum control valve needs adjusting. And that's all there is to it. Put the settings on the nose and be sure to use the correct specs. And that closes our story for this session. Al and Fred have covered a variety of facts about engine performance diagnosis that should be helpful to all you master technicians out there. As usual, we didn't get into all the details of periodic engine maintenance because those instructions are covered in your service manuals. The reference book for this session expands on the information included in the film, so be sure to give it a good reading. So long until the next meeting.